Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the second annual Global Education Conference. Uh, I'm Anna Gavell. I will be your moderator today. I'm the managing editor of The Washington Diplomat. We are excited to have a diverse lineup of speakers and an equally diverse uh, lineup of subjects that we'll be covering from what to expect from the Biden administration, how to build institutions overseas, educational institutions overseas, um, women in STEM, and uh, firsthand embassy perspectives on international student exchange. So we're excited to get started. We are on a platform called Hopin, which is a pretty unique platform. It's a little different, um, and we hope you enjoy it. We will have uh, networking breaks throughout the day, and you can, on your left-hand side, you'll see some buttons. You can, at the bottom, there's an expo button. That's going to take you to several booths um, where you can go. Uh, we have a booth for Cigna, Sahori Insurance, for Georgetown University, for Merit Academy. You can speak uh, with people there. You can watch videos. There'll be a raffle prize at the Cigna booth. So. Uh, during the breaks, please feel free to check that out. We also above that have a networking button and that will allow you to kind of uh, do the speed dating version of networking. So you will be matched up with a participant. We can uh, say hello and introduce yourself. So, uh, so I hope that you will avail yourselves of, of these opportunities. And of course, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists today. I want to thank, um, before we get started, the, the staff at The Diplomat, Victor Shibley, our publisher, um, Fuad Shibley, and, and Rod Carrasco, all of the, the interns and everyone who's helped us put this uh, conference together. Of course, I want to thank as well our sponsors and partners. We have Cigna, a health services company that operates worldwide. Uh, Google, as we all know, the American multinational tech company, Arizona State University, which is the number one university for innovation for six consecutive years, Centana, which connects universities to world-class resources and expertise, Sahori Insurance, which has been serving the diplomatic community for more than 50 years, and Georgetown University, which is the oldest Catholic and Jesuit institution of higher uh, higher learning in the United States. We also want to thank Gallup, West Virginia University, Radford University, the Institute of International Education, Merit Academy, and all of the embassies um, who are participating and joining us today as well as speaking. So we, uh, you know, we have, uh, it's interesting when I introduced the conference last year in person at, at the French embassy, uh, I talked about how education is one of those fields with such deeply personal resonance on so many interconnected levels. You know, you have the hyper-local level, the national level, and the inter international level. And of course, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has only heightened all of that. You know, throughout the country, throughout the world, Parents are struggling to stay home and teach their children while kids are struggling to learn from home. Everyone from elementary schools to Ivy League universities are struggling to figure out how to reopen safely. Um, the pandemic has exposed uh, a lot of the inequalities that have been in the educational system, both here in our own backyard and abroad. Uh, we are all uh, in the middle of a political transition here in the U.S. And then everyone all over the world is grappling with this, you know, phenomenon of virtual learning, which, uh, you know, the pandemic has forced uh, all of us on a steep learning curve. So actually, on that note, uh, because of some uh, technical issues, we are flipping the our first two panels. So we will still have um, former U.S. Education Secretary Arne Duncan and um, and um, uh, uh, sorry, Carrie uh, Mar Markuma of the of Inside Higher Ed. We will still have them the panel on Biden and what to uh, 
uh, look forward to in terms of educational priorities for the Biden administration. Uh, but we are starting off actually with the panel on building education institutions overseas. So we'll begin there. And in about, uh, I would say, uh, probably a little after 10, we'll go right into Arnie. So thank you for everyone for bearing with us uh, as we, again, discover the joys of, of uh connecting virtually and, and the joys of technology. But actually, I'm glad that we are starting off with the panel on building uh, education institutions overseas, because it, it actually kind of starts off on starts all of us off on a positive note. And the good news here is that higher education is exploding around the world. Um, according to the higher education company, Sintana, there are over 200 million students studying at some 20,000 universities around the world. But it's expected that this number could double to 400 or even 500 million students in just the next 10 or 15 years. And of course, it's not gonna be possible to just keep building more and more universities to accommodate this surge in students, all of whom are expecting a quality education. So the question becomes, how can these universities abroad improve their access to quality education, namely that offered by uh, so many of the top ranked uh, institutions here in the US. So to help answer that question, Arizona State University has created a unique partnership with um, the company Santana Education to help foreign universities expand their online and campus based programs. So I want to bring on our two panelists. Uh, we have Stephanie Lindquist and we also have uh, Wadia Atia. And I apologize if I mispronounced that. So let's see, do we have our two panelists uh, coming on board? Yes, good morning, Anna. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? I'm great, thank you so much. Uh, and hello, Wadia, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us uh, a bit early. So just to give the audience a little bit of, of background, uh, Dr. Stephanie Lindquist, uh, she is a law and political science professor at ASU and senior vice president of global academic initiatives. She's a widely recognized expert in the field of law who previously served as Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Georgia. And before that, she taught at the University of Texas School of Law and at Vanderbilt University. I was also a visiting faculty member at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. And we are, of course, also very pleased to welcome Wadia Atia, who is uh, the executive officer for the Middle East and North Africa region for Sintana Education. Originally from Lebanon, he grew up in Boston and DC and received his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees, all from American University here in DC. A uh, faculty member at Arizona State University. He has spent much of his career with Laureate Education, where he has helped set up 84 universities in Morocco, Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. So thank you both for, for joining us today. And where he has helped set up 84 universities in Morocco, Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. So thank you both joining us today. And I, I might be on an echo, but I'm going to go ahead and keep going um, because we do have, um, I know Wadia is uh, abroad. So, uh, and Stephanie, maybe we can we can start with you, but, you know, I, I gave a very brief uh, explanation of, of what uh, Arizona State University and Santana are doing. Uh, you know, can you elaborate and, and kind of explain this partnership a bit more in, in more detail for our audience? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Anna, <laughs> and good morning to everyone. Sintana uh, Education is a corporation, it's a public benefit corporation that was co-created uh, by Arizona State University and by Doug Becker, who is the former CEO of Laureate Education. And what we decided was that uh, we needed uh, the energy and dynamism of the private sector to help us uh, energize global education at ASU. Uh, as many of you, those uh, folks who are on the call know, it's difficult to build global campuses. Uh, it can be very challenging relative to the business model, uh, and many universities are hesitant to do so. We, of course, have a vast uh, global uh, footprint at ASU, but we decided that when it came to growing education around the world and addressing the need for scaling education around the world, 
we wanted to partner with um, some experts uh, from Laureate Education. So Doug left Laureate, Edu Laureate Education a couple of years ago, uh, met with Michael Crow, our president, uh, and decided that this would be a partnership that could really uh, help expand ASU's footprint relative to uh, de delivering education around the world. And again, it's a public benefit corporation. And what we do is we find uh, medium-sized uh, or small universities or even start our own new universities around the world and help them scale, help them grow, and help them improve their quality through access to some of ASU's digital assets, uh, through ASU's expertise in online education, and through Laureate's vast experience, and Wadi is a great example of this, uh, vast experience in identifying uh, universities that can grow and that can improve and bringing them within our alliance, uh, the Sintana Alliance. Mm -hmm. Well, Wadia, can you talk about some of your own experiences establishing these partnerships abroad? I mean, you've done uh, such a large number of them. Can you give us, you know, a few examples uh, that you've done and, you know, kind of how, uh, I guess, rel you know, in relation to Sintana, how this process works because I know we have a number of foreign um, educators who are watching, you know, who are wondering, you know, what, how they would go about, uh, uh, you know, participating in something like this. Sure. Uh, but first, uh, Anna, let me uh, correct you. I actually uh, started a handful of universities in the UAE, Morocco, Bahrain, and Saudi, not 84 global all across the world. Okay. And so that is uh, glorious. Credit for 84. Yes. <laughs> it's it's hard enough to start one or two, let alone 84. Listen, so, a handful is still quite <laughs> impressive. So, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm giving you, by the, you know, in the next few years, maybe you'll get to the 84. Who knows? <laughs> Partnerships, are, yeah. Well, well, the idea is how do you, uh, how do you um, blend the incredible resources that ASU has, and and ASU is a is a perfect model of the new American university, as Michael Crow would would call it, in the sense that it is a very efficient, highly effective institution that produces world-class research and world-class students and being able to do it in a very efficient, cost-efficient manner. I mean, here's a public institution that barely takes any money from the government, uh, mm -hmm. self-sustaining and has created a huge economic engine in Arizona. So how do you take this model, which is an extremely successful model, and try to um, it's not replicate, but sort of inculcate in other institutions overseas so that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. We don't have to keep trying to create that which we know works, works extremely well in America, in Arizona. And that's the beauty of the U.S. in the sense that, you know, there are 50 states. There's a lot of experimentation going on. But right now we have something proven that works. So the concept is we go, uh, let's say we partner with an institution in Saudi or in the UAE, and it is really blending the two to create the efficiency that ASU brings and the faculty collaboration on localized research to help that institution and that country develop economically. Because also one of the things you notice is that when it comes to faculty research, a lot of it is being done and for Western journals not being done locally. And so also to develop locally the economy, uh, I think collaborating between ASU faculty and the local faculty to develop that engine is also very beneficial. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, can you give us one or two uh, specific examples of some of the partnerships that you formed just to give uh, the audience a sense of you know, what is, you know, obviously a first step would be reaching out to you. But, you know, after that, you know, what are some of the the, the requirements that are, you know, that, that other institutions would need to meet? Uh, what are some of the time frames that they're looking at in terms of, you know, this coming to fruition? Are there any kind of examples that, that you could give to, to give people a bit of a roadmap of, of how this might work? Um, to Stephanie or Wadia, whoever would like to take it. I, I'd be, I'll, I'll be happy to start and then Wadia can, can also offer his examples. Um, a most recent uh, partner that we've developed, partnership we've developed is with uh, Istanbul Bilgi University. 
at, at an excellent university at the tip of the Golden Horn in Istanbul uh, with about 15,000 students. And uh, we've just recently entered into a partnership with them to build their programs. And the way it works is that Sintana uh, assists the university in operations, so uh, helps them develop recruitment mechanisms, marketing mechanisms, uh, retention mechanisms for students and student success. And ASU comes in with its digital assets to assist the universities in building their curriculum. So we have a vast reservoir, repertoire of, um, of uh, uh, digital uh, uh, curricular uh, assets that are in a repository and the university can gain access to them through a licensing agreement. And then they can use those assets to build their programs to articulate in particular degree programs with ASU so that the students can start their education at the home institution such as Bilby and then come to ASU perhaps for their final year if they choose join ASU online for their final year or come for a master's degree to continue their education through a pathway to ASU. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we also uh, help them uh, uh, and they help us, of course, with faculty research. So we build collaborations and research. It's a very tight partnership. And so the faculty get to know each other, the deans get to know each other. And unlike the typical relationship that many universities have with each other where they have an MOU and it really is dependent upon an individual faculty member to move the partnership forward. This is a very institutionalized structure so that the uh, from the very top to the very bottom of the university, everyone knows that this is a partnership that um, they can participate in as a faculty member, as a staff member, as a leader, uh, and help uh, develop these synergies. Um, absolutely, we need to, uh, to uh, tear down the silos that uh, separate universities. Universities will do much better and will help the world improve its conditions in many different respects if they work together. And this is part of our, our, our uh, project. Great. And would you, you know, if you could, um, you know, uh, offer your own thoughts on that, but also you had mentioned before of, you know, there's the, the, the cultural barriers. I mean, there, there's so many differences of among universities. So how also um, have you learned to kind of tailor this approach to, uh, you know, very specific uh, institutions in, in very specific countries? Um, great question. I'll just also go to the other form of partnership, if you don't mind. <laughs> We also partners at times with governments. So there are certain circumstances in which a government says, we are building X number of universities. These are Greenfield universities. And we come in with ASU and help set them up and provide a lot of the learned efficiencies uh, in terms of the new model to operate them and grow them. Uh, so that's another form. One is partnering with the universities and another one is partnering with the government to help manage their new institutions and grow them. And sometimes these institutions are done in a private public uh, structure. So that's also uh, quite beneficial. When it comes to culture, one the interesting thing is that university cultures are very similar globally in the sense that the students want to come, they want to learn, the faculty want to do research, and the synergies are there. The, so there are, of course, some cultural differences, uh, but those are minimal when it comes to institutions. Now, in some countries, if you have separation of the genders, that's a, that's a cultural difference that we have to deal with. And sometimes you have two campuses uh, where the, you know, one for females and one for males. But that's th those barriers are also breaking down considerably. So I, I would say we take culture into account, but it's not it, it's not what it used to be uh, even a decade ago. It's changing mm -hmm. rapidly. Okay. Now, in Odia, you had mentioned um, public-private partnerships. Um, so moving to what governments can do, what are some of your thoughts on what? foreign governments can do to, you know, help uh, you know, scale up uh, their education offerings without compromising quality. I mean, of course, you know, partnering with, with institutions such as yourself is, is one option. But, you know, in general, what are you seeing? What would you advise governments, especially governments from developing nations where cost is a huge barrier? 
I mean, of course, you know, every government can say, hey, I will build this world class, you know, university, but that's not an option for uh, much of the world. So, you know, what in general are your thoughts on, on how governments can uh, are going to need to step up on the education front in the coming years? Uh, it's a question of access and accessibility. What what one of the things we found out, which is really interesting, is that government institutions, a lot of the public institutions globally, are fantastic, are really really good, and most of them are for free. The question then is, who is going to them? And when you look deeper into it, you find it's the most privileged of the population that is attending the public institutions because in order to get in because of limited access because as you said financial uh, constraints so the, the the students that get the scores from the best private schools end up going to the most prestigious public institution so it's not giving access to the middle class and to the sort of the economic growth of a country so the the in our opinion, the best thing is to do the public-private institutions in order to provide accessibility to the rising middle class. Otherwise, you're going to hamper the issue. Who can go to a university? Uh, so there's that one element. And then the other element is the question of what is the purpose of the university in these countries? You have a cultural shift where no one wants to go to Votech. Everybody wants to have a university degree, even though the university degree may not be suitable. Uh, the seats or the accessibility in these universities, the technical, let's say the STEM or the technical majors are not available. So a lot of people are going and um, studying in areas just to say we have a college degree that, are, that is not uh, conducive to the economy. So by having the private public partnerships, you're really providing education also as a service, as a right to the economy, because your other customer is the economy and the corporate sector that needs labor that can perform the functions in the 21st century. So right. this is why you need the market mechanisms to tell you what is needed. Yeah, and well, and certainly that lesson applies here in the U.S. as well, where you know you don't want uh, a degree just for the sake of having a degree. You know, and more and more universities are recognizing you need a degree especially with, you know, the costs of, of education that will ultimately, you know, put you in a job field that, that has jobs. <laughs> it gives you a return on your investment. And that's, again, I say the ASU model, because you look at many of the graduates from ASU and, and you look at what what's the pay? I mean, what is the return? And these students who graduate from such a great institution, which doesn't cost as much as some of our, let's say, prestigious institutions that the ASU is, it's very prestigious, but let's say the elite privates, um, I mean, if the ASU graduates make as much, if not more. And so the question is, what's the purpose, yeah. especially in the developing economies? Right. Let's, let's replicate what is cost efficient and effective for the student, the parents, and the economy. That's what we, we are stressing. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, let me follow up on that real quickly, Anna, <clears throat> because one of the major issues that American universities have had in terms of expanding their operations and their uh, degree programs abroad, of course, is affordability. Uh, many foreign students come to the U.S., but that's very expensive. And when you want to set up a branch campus somewhere, which many universities have done, often you have to rely on the resources that a government's willing to provide to set up that branch campus because uh, it's very expensive to do so. And so the issue of affordability becomes very critical. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason that we established Centana, because in partnership with universities around the world, what we can do is we can help bolster curriculum without having to move all of the operations of ASU into a different location. Um, we can bolster the curriculum and, and help students with articulated degree programs at ASU, uh, but it, it, it still remains affordable for them because they're going to university in their own country. Um, so, I mean, no, we, you know, affordability has been such an issue that, that we've been talking about also yesterday, we'll continue to talk about. And I think, you know, when we think of affordability, we certainly think uh, it's, it's a crisis here in the United States, almost you could describe it. Um, because certainly universities, uh, and universities um, are pricing American kids out of school. Um, and this is, I think, a big misconception, too, that international students face the same uh, 
if not worse, dilemma, because we're used to thinking of international students as coming here and paying full tuition and so forth. But that is only an option for a very small segment of, you know, of the, the population overseas. So I want to get into this kind of starts begins to touch on the issue of inequality, which, as we know, the pandemic has really exposed. So. Wadia, can you, I guess, a twofold question for, for both of you, and we'll start with you, Wadia. Uh, you know, what, what have you noticed in terms of the pandemic? We're now, you know, over nine months in. How has that impacted Sintana? And then more broadly, what do you think that has revealed about um, of inequalities? Um. On the question of impact, what was interesting is the uh, governments realizing uh, and a lot of universities realizing that they need to have the option on hybridity because many of them did not. This caught them by complete surprise in the lectures. They, you know, they shifted to Zoom as compared to having a robust online system as in the case of ASU where they basically switched everybody on and it was a fantastic system that's been developed over years. So I think the, it exposed the weaknesses of institutions to deal in a lockdown situation. I think that that is one. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, the issue of inequality, uh, it, and again, I would say it is, and uh, uh, I mean, this might sound kind of a little bit out there, but it, it is inequality of technological access because those that had access to the internet, those that had access to the know-how of how to convert and create an effective learning mechanism did, did quite well. Those that were basically turning Zoom on and just doing a lecture mm -hmm. created a massive uh, deficiency in the learning and teaching process. So right. I think from our perspective, it was technological access, both on the university front, planning front, and for the students who did not have access to the resources that we take for granted in most of the United States and Europe. Right. And, you know, we talked about that actually yesterday with Google of how providing technology, throwing a laptop at the issue is not enough. You know, there has to be the learning behind it and, and you know, the concept. And so does Sintana, uh, a follow up question, I mean, is that part of Sintana's role in ASU in terms of you know, not just helping with access to the technology, but helping people understand and how to best use the technology, as you said, not just putting up a, you know, a Zoom uh, uh, um, screen. Of course, it's it's train the trainer on how to utilize the technology that becomes available through the partnership. That is, a, and that's an absolute as, as part of the services developed in any partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie, did you have any thoughts on, well, you know, how the pandemic in general, uh, observations of how it's impacted, um, you know, education in general and also um, education at, at ASU um, and, you know, and what it, it's, it's revealed in terms of these kind of systemic inequalities that, um, that have been there for that have been here for decades and, and is continues to be kind of a, a, a stubborn problem. Sure. Well, uh, you know, at ASU, we had the benefit of what was essentially kind of a first mover among the first mover status relative to online education. And we've seen a surge in our online uh, enrollments. We've got more than 250 full degree programs online now, and we're now uh, approaching 80,000 students online. So we've really seen a tremendous upsurge in, in interest in those programs. And, um, and I think it's worth noting that we've been working on this for now for about 15 years, developing our online programs. And each program involves about 150 ed tech uh, collaborators. I mean, this uh, building a, a very effective online degree program requires a lot of input from the private sector as well as from the institution. So it's a complex project that we've uh, focused our attention on at ASU through a, a special unit that we call Ed Plus, which is its own unit that helps the unit, the, uh, the academic units in the institution uh, develop their own, uh, uh, their own online programs through institutional designers. And that's been very, very critical to build that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I think what caught many universities by surprise was the complexity of teaching online if they weren't already prepared as ASU was. 
Um, one way we've tried to address this at ASU in terms of helping uh, the world develop its online capabilities is uh, through a remote summit that we hosted a couple of months ago. We welcomed about 25,000 uh, professors and teachers from around the world who are interested in learning about how to, for example, teach lab science online, how to teach dance online, how to teach uh, the arts online. And that was very, very successful and remains, uh, the, the materials remain online. If you just uh, Google Remote Summit ASU, you'll find it. And so there's a series of lectures on there to help, uh, help faculty members around the world develop their online capability. Um, one point I think is worth noting here though, is as students learn to, uh, to engage uh, in their education digitally, we then have to think about what does that mean for the in-classroom experience? One thing that I think universities have found that as they've moved their programs online, many students choose to stay online permanently, right? They, even if the classroom is open. And that means you need to make the classroom experience extremely exciting as well and rethink how we teach in the classroom to draw students back in to the extent that we stay at least for the next semester in a hybrid modality, which is what we're doing at ASU. So I think that's worth thinking about. Um, as for uh, equities and inequities, uh, I think it's important um, globally for governments to think about how they can reconfigure their regulations and laws governing digital education, uh, obviously with a focus on quality, uh, but nevertheless open the world to innovation in this context. There are many countries around the world that still have very rigid regulations about online education. They've opened up uh, for the sake of the pandemic, but otherwise have not necessarily uh, enabled accreditation of online degrees uh, in general. And I think that's really an important move that needs to be made, again, with a focus on quality. Um, one thing we do at ASU is we have what we call an action lab in EdPlus, the unit that I previously mentioned. And that is focused entirely on assessing the statistics of student performance and outcomes to ensure that our online students are, are enjoying the same experience and, and achieving the same learning outcomes that our students in our classrooms do. And so it needs to be, all digital education needs to be accompanied by a research uh, uh, a capability to ensure that the students are, are again, achieving the outcomes that they would have achieved in the classroom. Right. Well, that's an excellent point that you made, and it was something we heard from uh, several panelists yesterday, including um, the representative from Google, who actually used to be a uh, teacher for Chicago Public Schools and, and ironically was, uh, a, as she called it, a technophobe. And it was a, an issue, and I'm sure you've seen this as, as educators, where you have a set vision of what a classroom looks like. And adapting that and changing this vision of a classroom that we've had for decades is very difficult. You know, Wadia, as you said, a lot of people think, okay, well, I'll just add a screen to it and do this when it's more about incorporating and, and fundamentally transforming the classroom experience. And I'm curious, what do you both think, you know, do you see online learning as really becoming the the new norm in international um, education, and what does that mean for kind of the physical student exchange programs? Wadia, any thoughts, or Stephanie? I don't think the uh, what uh, I, I don't think the undergraduate experience is going to change tremendously in terms of in terms of the physical aspect of it there will be a large percentage that will go hybrid will take courses fully online but i don't think it's going to fundamentally transform that cultural experience that happens for the 18 to the 18 to 22 year olds i think that it's not just about the education it's also about the culture and being with fellow students and learning to become an adult that's sort of the rite of passage um, but the question is, how do we do it effectively and efficiently? And I think Stephanie made an excellent point in terms of uh, regulations, foreign regulations, because I think in countries that don't have enough universities, I mean, you can double your undergraduate enrollment if you allow online to be you know, uh, to be completely incorporated in your undergraduate program. So you don't have to attend 100% on campus. If you attended 50% on campus and 50% online, you've just doubled your capacity and you, you can internationalize the programs. So it's amazing the little tweaks and changes that 
countries can do from a regulatory framework that can overnight practically double the capacity. It doesn't mean you double the faculty capacity, but you double the physical capacity of the campus. So I think that's very important. And then uh, if there's enough time, we can talk about the changing role of IT and what's coming in terms of the educational technology, because it's not going to be that flat screen that we're talking on in the future. And I think Stephanie has some interesting uh, uh, topics to discuss in terms of what ASU is doing on the experimentation phase on the teaching side. Okay, great. Stephanie, what, uh, what's going on? <laughs> well, um, before I, I talk about our interesting partnership with Dreamscape, I, I, um, I do want to make the point about uh, the on-campus experience. You know, um, many foreign students, uh, international students, want to come to the United States for the experience of being in the United States. Do they need to come all four years? No, not necessarily. Um, but they want to come to experience the U.S. and in some cases take advantage of our optional practical training opportunities that are offered here in the U.S., et cetera. So I think that interest in the campus experience won't go away. But I think what's wonderful about this new hy hybridity and our, our hybrid learning uh, modalities that we're experimenting with is that it really does, as Wadia uh, mentioned, it does offer students more flexibility in how they uh, engage uh, uh, in their learning uh, pathway, in their learning journey. Um, and, the, and, it, and it opens up doors for individuals who are not in the traditional 18 to 22 year old year category who are, for example, working adults and they want to, uh, to work while learning. And obviously digital education makes that uh, available to them. And this is, I think, gets to the inequities that you were mentioning earlier, Anna, that we need to think about learners throughout their lifetime and not just in that category of 18 to 22 and ensure that we create flexible learning environments for them as well. So that's, I think, very important. And one other thing I just want to say about the Zoom classrooms, we need to also think about the opportunities these open for international collaborations. My goodness gracious, now we can, we can welcome students from around the world into our classrooms, really truly in a collaborative online learning experience. Uh, and that I think is very exciting. And I hope that universities who are now equipping Zoom classrooms at ASU, we've got now a thousand Zoom classrooms, with you know, uh, microphones descended from the ceilings and all kinds of cameras everywhere. Um, that really does, uh, I think, enable uh, universities to partner in unique ways that were not, that was not previously available. Um, one of the things that uh, ASU is, is trying to, is, is working on now is, is a virtual reality experience. Uh, we have partnered with a, a Hollywood company basically called Dreamscape that uh, builds virtual reality uh, experiences. And what we're doing is we've built a huge it's essentially a black box in our Creative Commons at the ASU campus. And when you go into that block, black box, you enter into a virtual reality experience and we're building a biology program where students will enter into a new alien world. And while they're in that alien world, they'll encounter new flora and fauna and they will be able to test the soil and test the atmosphere. And this kind of simulation uh, is something that ASU has done also in our space exploration programs where we have a simulation of uh, going to Mars and you, you track your trajectory to Mars, you get onto the planet, you uh, equip, equip yourself with your spacesuit, you walk out onto the planet, uh, you test the atmosphere, you experience different gravity. And, um, and so this is the kind of experience students are used to. A, a, a gamification of education, I think, is an important uh, uh, avenue that we need to seriously consider and virtual reality. And the virtual reality, of course, will help us with, with issues uh, such as the laboratory experience. Um, we can uh, uh, have students be engaged in the lab, but they're doing so virtually instead of in person. All right. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I was going to uh, ask about virtual reality in the classroom. And I imagine, too, as that expands globally, again, that's, that's kind of um, a way to, to almost shrink the world because people can have similar experiences. You can have American students, um, you know, also not even just space, but possibly, uh, you know, doing a dig in a foreign country. Um, and, you know, the possibilities there are, are just so amazing and endless. And I'm also glad that you brought up the issue of higher education for older adults. Uh, I mean, I've personally seen it in in just my own career of of so many people I know have gotten their masters while they continue to work. 
Um, and I imagine, you know, Wadia, maybe you can speak to this, that that is so critical too for countries, for instance, like Turkey, many countries that have over the last decade, you know, leapfrogged economically. And so now, you know, people in their 30s and 40s have these kind of um, economic opportunities. They have that ability to have a job, but weren't 10, 15 years ago able to go to attend a university, whereas they can now. So is that um, something you've seen as a trend where, uh, again, these partnerships are not strictly for, you know, the 18, 22 year old age bracket? Are you seeing a lot of, uh, you know, older people coming in and taking advantage of this? Sure, and this is this is exactly where online uh, works very well, like fully online is for the professionals that want to increase their skills or want to get another degree. And it's they have the discipline, they have the structure for it, they don't need that cultural shift that happens at the university. That's exactly who it you know who it normally targets. Uh, in in our previous company at Laureate, I mean, uh, one uh, we had the largest online uh, institution. Uh, it was about one tenth the size of our one million students. I think it had about a hundred thousand students, but mainly they were graduate professionals uh, mm -hmm. who wanted to um, increase their skills and their abilities. But one of the things, uh, going back to inequality for a second, one of the things that we'll find in the augmented virtual reality education is that in many countries, uh, what you have is that there's a large segment of the student population that's left behind because of their learning differences. And what you would find with augmented reality, because it's multi-sensory, a lot of kids or kids, a lot of students that may, may not have succeeded in the traditional way, you'll mm -hmm. find that when they're using multi-sensory augmented virtual reality, uh, their level of interest and their abilities are there because they're learning the way they humans learned for thousands of years which is learned by doing that's that's one and the other thing is that it 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 adjusts to their pace and speed so we really we've been talking about uh, online educational technology uh, you know 30 years for the last 30 years now we're seeing a big leap where we're ready to jump to the next level where i think it'll be the, that type of education experience will be a great equalizer in many respects mm -hmm. and you know, on this this great leap forward, uh, as you can see, uh, even with with us, I mean, I I have yet maybe it's just me. I have yet to have a Zoom meeting or another meeting that has gone off completely without a hitch. So, um, you know, I think everyone is kind of learning in real time because of of this reliance now that's that's been sped up to um, on on virtual connectivity. You know, so what. You know, what have, you know, obviously the pandemic kind of has interrupted everyone's, uh, you know, workflow and how they they function. But, you know, since you've started this program in, in 2019 um, and including the pandemic, what are some of the the lessons that you've learned from from some of the the hiccups that that you've encountered along the way so far? And Stephanie, we can start with you if you'd like. Well, sure. Um, in terms of the Centana partnership, I have to say that uh, we've been uh, chugging along at a, at, a, at a considerable rate of speed, even in the face of the pandemic. I think Zoom has enabled us to uh, meet with people around the world. I usually start my day, you know, early in the morning in some perhaps in Egypt and then end my day uh, maybe in Uzbekistan. Um, and it's uh, it's incredible how much work we're able to to get done. In fact, one might argue that we're able to to achieve more through Zoom because the time spent traveling um, is is obviously can be taken up with actually doing work, thinking, talking, uh, discovering, uh, creating. Now that having been said, obviously being in an in, a, in an actual location is important, and I have been doing a little bit of traveling uh, during the pandemic, but the pandemic uh, has interrupted those interpersonal experiences, and I think that's. Uh, you know, you can certainly have interpersonal experiences on Zoom, but sitting across the table with someone and having a meal uh, can't be replaced by Zoom. So we're very much looking forward to the pandemic receding uh, and we're hopeful about the vaccine, of course. But in terms of hiccups, I, um, you know, I, at ASU, what we've tried to do is, is be very proactive in the face of, of this pandemic. We have 
develop saliva tests that are free to everyone who is a university uh, affiliate in some way, students and faculty. You can take a, a saliva test anytime and receive your results within 24 hours. Uh, and so the um, we've just got an incredible group of scientists who are developing these tests and have now are now in the process of developing a, uh, a test that you can take with you and that will give you the results after you spit into the tube. <laughs> so it, it's pretty amazing. I think, you know, one thing about ASU, of course, is we have these vast resources, a $3.4 billion operation with thousands of scientists and students who can help. Um, and I think sharing those experiences and sharing those technologies globally will be very important to address the kinds of interruptions that other universities have faced uh, who may not have those vast resources, especially smaller colleges. Um, so, right. yeah, we've been fortunate at ASU because of the resources that we can bring to bear the problem. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's, uh, I've, I've done one of the tests myself, I had to, and and I mean, it's, it's such a process and it's one thing, you know, in, in general, but when you're in a college environment like that, a campus, it becomes, uh, it's a whole other ball game. As, as you know, college kids like to congregate, <laughs> socialize. So the, it's a whole different dilemma. And as you said, uh, it, it requires a tremendous amount of resources. So, um, but would you, uh, you know, what have you learned from the, the Santana partnership and also over your, your long career? Because this is something you've spent so many years uh, working on. I think my takeaway message is that we, should, uh, building institutions around the world, we should not replicate the 17th century British German model that was geared for the top one tenth of one percent of the population. Our many of the institutions around the world are still operating in the classic model that creates the massive inequality that we see because they're geared for a, two centuries ago, not even the 20th century. And I hope we can learn how to replicate the models that we know that have succeeded and that can bring great benefit to the students and the country where we operate. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for, for not only joining us, but joining us early. We appreciate, uh, you bearing with us through our own uh, technological hiccups um, and and for all of these insights we will uh, I will put on uh, the chat function links to Santana and to ASU uh, you can also just visit our own website washdiplomat.com we of course will have video of of this conference and you can always email us as well news at washdiplomat.com uh, for the folks in the audience we are going to take a brief break and then we will return with uh former secretary of education arnie duncan and uh, we will uh, be talking about what we can expect from the biden administration so but we'll be taking about a 10 minute break and in that time again if you would like you can Click on the left-hand side. We talk about Zoom, but we have a, a different platform, Hopin, which uh, does allow, I think it's kind of unique that it allows you to, to network, uh, kind of try to mimic the in-person um, the in-person concept of, of meeting other people that are sitting in on this. Uh, so you can visit the expo booths and, and talk with folks there. You can also click networking and connect. It'll be a very brief kind of uh, hello with somebody and then you just click a button if you want to continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you can click a button. I believe it is on your right top, but you can chat for up to three minutes and I think there, there'll be instructions. So obviously I'm, I'm learning as I go as well. But um, so please uh, take advantage of that and please rejoin us in 10 minutes for our discussion on the Biden administration. And again, thank you so much, uh, Wadia and Stephanie, for all of your insights today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.